The idea is to talk about you, like your background, how you got started, uh, mm -hmm. how you've been able to, you know, to earn a living uh, making music. Mm -hmm. uh, so I know you, you know, you sing cover songs and you've done music production. So, you know, just knowing more about you, how you build that business. And then we'll yeah. talk about where you're at now and like what avenues you want to pursue. Um, if that works for you, that'd be awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Very cool. Cool. Uh, do you want to take us like right from the beginning, how you got started? Oh man. How did I yeah. get started in music? <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well, I mean, okay. So I, I, my first instrument was trombone and, uh, cause I know yours is trumpet. Yeah, exactly. And, <laughs> and my, my dad even got me a, I was an all state trombonist in, in, um, in the States. It's, uh, there's a thing most states have is called all state. So when you're in high school or junior high, you can audition to be part of that. So I was always a, a first trombone. It's not first chair, but you know, I played first trombone in all state for like, I don't know, seventh grade through, through, you know, senior. Okay. And, um, and I sang and did music theater and all that. And, um, but I ended up getting encouraged really to go into engineering because I started programming when I was a kid mm -hmm. um, on just like old Apple IIe's Commodore Pets way back in the day. When you were a kid? And when I was seven was when I started really? programming. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. I mean, like I was, I, I don't know if you remember GeoCities. Like I was doing <laughs> websites with GeoCities. That's so, I was a little Kevin the kid. I mean, I'm a kid, you know, <clears throat> on a computer in my, you know, in, in my bedroom and or in, you know downstairs in my house in Alabama and Duncanville we have a dial-up you know and it's just oh man it was but yeah I was like you know I began to get into like web development and all that stuff and of course I was a musician I wanted to go to music but um, I was just encouraged I wasn't encouraged to go into music I mean, my mom wanted me to but not anybody else everyone else was like uh, you know you should be an engineer and yeah. I even got a, a scholarship in um, aerospace engineering and I'm like, mm, no, I don't want to go into that. So <laughs> I, it, it's a long story. I ended up moving out to Arizona. I just met this guy on the internet. This is when you didn't meet people on the internet, <laughs> but I did. You know, here It didn't work out, but I ended up out here and went to ASU and got a computer science degree and then was continuing on uh, working on a PhD in digital signal processing. Okay. Um, so I worked at General Dynamics. I did just, I was all through the dot com doing, I was, you know, making six figures at 26 years old. Um, at General Dynamics. And the thing is, I realized that I really, really, really wanted to do music. I had I just barely started trying to play piano. I was um, uh, singing with this uh, salsa band and mm -hmm. I singing in Spanish and I and I was playing trombone too. So there was that. And I realized I wanted to learn Spanish. So all of these things coming together and then also trying to learn piano because I'm like, I and that's start. all when you were around 25, 26 and working exactly. full time. Okay. Absolutely. I started, I started piano. Uh, I think it was 24 when I started playing piano and you were um, working full time already. That was like on the side. Yeah. Exactly. Full time as an engineer, um, mainly DSP engineer. So it's digital signal processing is, is really electrical engineering in that okay. field, but it's mostly, it's just programming and calculus and, and coding and understanding waveforms. And I really wanted to do audio and I was actually working on a, the HMS radio for, um, the Marines or the army. I don't remember, but anyway, it's been a, been a while. Thankfully I'm not doing that anymore, but it was, it, I really wanted to do DSP for music. That was really what I wanted to do. And my counselor at the time was like, cause I was telling her, Oh, I want to go work for Yamaha, whatever. Right. Convolution reverbs and all that kind of stuff Do you know, sound design. And she was like, sounds like you really just want to be a musician and you're just beating around the bush. Yeah. And I was like, whoa, do slash. And so I could, because I could barely speak Spanish, I could play piano okay, get, enough to get by. Strong voice though. I sang with Arizona Opera, so I'd always been a strong vocalist. And I started taking voice lessons when I was like 14. Okay. I um, realized that I can be a research assistant. I was 26, 26, 27. 27. I can be a research assistant in my PhD program and make $27,000 a year, or mm -hmm. I can probably go out and play gigs and make $30,000 a year, you know, and play music. Okay. So, so how did would it get to the, you were already working and making six figures, but yes. then the yes. other opportunity was research assistant for 27? Yes. Because I was, I knew that I had to leave engineering. Okay. So you had to, okay. And, mm -hmm. and the point was I wanted to have more time to work on music. So yes. why would I go and be an RA and be a slave for some postdoc, you know, <sighs> whereas the idea was like, oh, I'll have more time to work on music. And, 
and then it hit me because I'm sitting here trying to think, okay, so I'll be, I'll be done with general dynamics. I won't have to be doing that, you know, anymore, but how am I going to keep my townhouse? You know, I, mm-hmm. I had, didn't have big expenses. I didn't live extravagantly anyway. Um, and I saved my money. So there was that, but I just like, how can I afford my townhouse if I'm only making $27,000 a year? And then it just kind of hit me like I could make over 30 as a musician. I know I could, you know, I've already got little, little gigs here and there that paid a little bit, maybe make a hundred bucks, 125. And I knew if I could do this full time that I would be able to make good money. So I had this decision and I came up with an exit plan and I so ended up. Before we go, get to you, your exit plan, um, how are you organizing your time when you were working full time? So um, okay. when I was working full time for a while, I was just like going to music schools and taking online courses during the evening or during the weekends, or I was traveling gotcha. a lot for work, so I would do that. Uh, but then when I needed to be more creative, Sometimes I would just block out time where I would do, especially towards the end, actually, uh, where my job was really taking more and more energy out of me. So I yes. needed to get the music done before I went to the office. Mm. If I went to the office when I got back, it was hit or miss. You know, sometimes I'd have the energy, sometimes I wouldn't. So what I did was I would wake up like super early and go to bed super early um, just so I would get the music done before. What, what about you? Well, you know, everyone has different rhythms. Yeah. And um, I know, I've found out that when I wake up, my, I can, I'm a better programmer. I'm a better engineer first thing in the morning. And that's audio engineering or like computer programming. Okay. So which I still do, by the way, I'm developing you know, my, own, my own stuff. But so I would, I would go up, I, but you're right. It was taking the energy and it couldn't, days were inconsistent. So yeah. basically my evenings um, usually I'd be tired. I would, uh, but I would just go home and probably, I think I would play, um, maybe a, a video game, like those dance video games, you know, where you dance around and moving it and I would exercise. And so that was always good. And I would help, help get my mind off of general dynamics and that, um, uh, project that I was working on. And then I would just go and sit in front on my piano and just play and just practice. And I mean, for me, it was like, I need to be able to get through a gig. I need to be able to play enough songs to be able to get gigs to make money. Another th- one thing I was doing is also playing for the Catholic church, which pays really well too. And I'm Catholic. So that helped as, as well. And so, so I, um, I got to where I just, I was, I was able to play, uh, one church. No, actually I ended up doing t- two services, one in Spanish. The first I ever played for, I ever led was in Spanish mm-hmm. and then, and then another in, in English. And so I was making like 200 bucks a weekend, just playing mm-hmm. for like two hours ish. No, wait a minute, it was 225 because the Spanish one was 125 because I had to have a rehearsal beforehand with the group like 45 minutes before, no big deal. So I was already doing that. And I knew that if I could do that more, then I would be able to um, make a living. And so that I had that going on. So every evening, I mean, I just had this intense goal. It wasn't so much composing. I did do a lot of a composition, but it was more about my thoughts were, I want to be a professional musician. I want, my goal is to be a great musician. It wasn't performing. to make a living. To me, just making a living as a musician was a success. Yeah. You know, and it wasn't like I didn't have some vision of a recording studio or being a recording engineer or anything like that. I just wanted to, to make a living and be able to keep my townhouse and make maybe $35,000 a year or whatever as a musician. And so okay. that's what I spent my nights doing practice. I practiced a lot. Talk about shedding. You know, yeah, I shed a lot every okay. night. Throughout. So, so yeah, the, the, at that point, it was really like the goal was having... Uh, long enough set that you can play live gigs and and get a yes. decent income, and you had you know a ballpark figure that you wanted to reach annually. So you had a ballpark monthly, monthly income target as well. Yeah, okay. it wasn't so much a monthly, but it was more of no, a yeah. You you had a pretty good grasp of what, from what I hear. You had a pretty good grasp of what your expenses were, what you would need to. Um, you didn't just like. Um, actually, may, now might be a good time for you to walk us through your exit strategy, but it, it sounds like you didn't just go, okay, now I'll be a professional musician. You actually thought it through and knew exactly how much you needed, and you saw that it was realistic before you actually made the big jump. Precisely. And well, what happened, what helped me make the jump was I saw a job for a music director position. And, okay. and, at, um, and, but, the, but the music director had to speak Spanish. They needed someone that speaks Spanish and every, I mean, a music director position at a Catholic church is usually like, okay, you have to, 
um, you have to have a music degree. Well, I don't have a music degree. I have an engineering degree. So, I mean, I did apply, but no one would even call me back because I have a, I don't have a music degree. I have an engineering degree. But you I mean, did I had apply. Experience. That's what now? But you did I, apply. Oh, yeah. Why not? And I oh, even wrote, like, that I'm great <laughs> and I'm a great singer and da 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 And that, they didn't even call me back. It was just like, <laughs> they had this list. And that's fine. And I, I did apply. I knew it, but it, it was a miracle because... The, um, the church that I thought was like, you know what, I need to be at a church like Queen of Peace, that's a, where I could, you know, get enough work, because they have like all this Spanish community, have a huge Spanish community, and that's a new where I had an advantage, and I just went on my own to decide to learn Spanish, and just, that was, but that ended up being such a huge asset, I mean, you know how it is, when you, because you, you're bilingual too, at least, yeah. if not other languages, you have your French and English, so um, that, I'll, gave me the courage and this specifically the job where I said uh experience more important than degree and Spanish was required mm -hmm. and I'm like holy shit so I I stuck it and sure enough I got an interview for it and um and it wasn't this was like in March or April and the job wouldn't start till July 1st and you were how old by then it was you were 27 you 27. still had your you still had your full-time job then yes I yeah. was working at, yes, I was, and they offered me, I mean, literally in my brain, remember I said like 35 or so, they offered me 36. So I go, I went from 102 to 36, but I had already figured out that I could maybe do it at 27. So I knew I was going to be fine, nice. but I had been saving. I didn't have any debt. You know, I'd paid everything down. Um, and so I, I was able to do a clean break. And, and I was already living under my means. So whether or not you end up taking just a different type of job or you can get on um, like as a music teacher position or whatever, if you're leaving one career to go into a musical career, in my case, it's, it's, um, well, it's, I only, I mean, it's a full-time job, but I spend maybe 20 hours a week yeah. at it. It's, just, you know, that kind of thing. It's full-time yeah. with benefits. So that's nice. And it's all music. That's all I do, you know? So um, but, but, but the point is that I had, I had a plan. I, I had saved, you know, I'd saved money. I didn't have any debt. I had, I was living below my means already, you know, so I wasn't, so when I, when I went from, I wasn't spending all of that 102 that I was making or who knows after taxes, I was bringing home 65 or 70 or something, you know, but I, I was, I was living, I, again, living below your means. That's an important thing. I see people that make half or, or a third or a quarter of the money that I make and they go out to eat and they get their coffee drinks and they do all this. I'm like, I, you're just squandering your money, you know? So. Something I want to mention actually is, uh, so I used to work in, in uh, financial audit and, and I did similar, similar to you. I, I saved up a lot of money, um, lived below my means. Yes. And one thing I like to point out is um, that, I didn't go to the restaurants or buy fancy cafes, but, but um, I like I did spend like 10k on music school. So oh, well, that's not, different. It, yeah, no, but I mean, it's not like if if you make a good income, you can still have a really good, fulfilling life. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, and and live comfortably, even and still save money. So yes. um, I didn't have a lot of expenses because I was traveling a lot for work. So my expenses were pretty much covered when and, and, you know. The yeah. entire meals were covered when I when I was um, traveling, but yeah. I was able to to put aside a lot of money. And I don't know about you, but I had enough saved up for like just two or three years worst case scenario. Oh um, no, I wasn't like, that good. <laughs> yeah. No, but it's I'm I'm a again I was in finance, so I'm a little bit you know uh, I love Excel is one of my favorite. Oh, I do too. I'm on spreadsheets yeah. every day. I've got uh, preloaded on my laptop yeah. over here, but. But yeah, I was, I was more like three months. <laughs> yeah, but it's still, so it, it's still good. That's, that's what I wanted to ask you about. Um, but when I left, when I, uh, when I first left my job, I didn't have like, like you found a really stable position right away. Yes. I had income coming in from licensing. But yes. as you know, that income is, some of it is recurring, but it really fluctuates. Yeah. So I had more savings, but uh, I was jumping to a much less uh, secure uh, yes. situation whereas maybe you only had like three four months savings mm -hmm. uh, but you were jumping in with a pretty secure position so yeah, and I made them give me a contract too because yeah. um I, I was like I'm leaving 
a hundred and two thousand dollar a year job to be a music director and make 36 i want a contract because i just want to feel secure i mean i really did and he was like oh i don't the the priest that hired me was like well i always do at will and i'm like "Mm -mm, you're gonna make an exception this time yeah and he did and after that i stayed at will because i mean you know you you when you're when you're doing a good job and people like you and you're serving well and it was all again it was just all music and that's where my compositions began to take off a lot too and just because like i had the time you know um to finally begin to work on and a lot of my skill was just trying to become a better musician you know i mean i had only been playing piano like two years or okay. you know or three years or so when i when i um started this job so i was really a and even the, the priest that hired me was like, well, you know, he, part of the interview was in Spanish. So I was like, okay, you can speak Spanish. That's important. And you're, 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 you're able to, you know, communicate well enough. And, um, you know, your piano is sufficient. Your voice is great. So yeah. that was, I mean, my voice again was, and this priest even says that when he has his funeral, this was, you know, again, years ago, but he wants me to sing at his funeral. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not surprised. I mean, you're, you're I, I told you last time we spoke, you've got an incredible voice. Thank you. Wow. I, I keep, keep working on it, you know, and that's another thing, the continual learning. That's something that you said you spent a whole bunch of money on music school. I've spent yeah. a lot of money on, on lessons and just mostly private instruction on piano yeah. and, um, and, uh, and voice. So I've spent a lot on that. And you're right, it's continued learning because by the time I was paying for my music schools in, in London and online, I, I already had like 15 years at the conservatory in, you know, <laughs> the conservatoire in France. And yeah. I, I already had, you know, I was already trained um, as a classical musician, but it's yes. just learning, learning new stuff. Like you had the trombone and you had the vocal lesson, but still you went and learned Spanish and you went and learned the piano. So, yeah. and what I love is that you actually learned the Spanish before it became necessary. So the fact that you were learning stuff is something that then got you your opportunity. Yeah. Well, it's just, I, I talk a lot and here I am trying to, you know, play trombone and sing in the salsa band and, and only like two people can speak English because they're all Cuban and, you know, and like the two Puerto Ricans can actually speak English and Spanish. And I was just frustrated. I'm like, I am going to learn Spanish and I'm going to be able to talk with you people and not have to go through a translator, you know, every time I want to say something. And I just was just fearless in that. And it, in, um, in the Phoenix area, it's easier to do because there's so many Mexicans here, yeah. even though I learned from Cubans and Puerto Ricans. And I just, I just like was fearless. I would go into the Mexican market and just start trying to speak Spanish, you know, Awesome. And if people would, if they would talk to me in English, I'd be like, I'm going to keep responding in Spanish, you know, because I want you to speak Spanish with me. And what, know, was that something that was hard for you to do? Is that something you, cause I can't see myself doing that. I would be terrified. Is that something you had to work on or that comes naturally to you? That fearlessness? Well, I think that's a, a, an extroversion versus, versus introversion kind of thing. And, and confidence. I was, I was confident. I knew that, and, and I've made, I, I mean, I call it the gringa card, right? Because I I'm a gringa, so I everyone knew that. I don't they don't even no one even began to think that maybe I was Mexican or Cuban or anything like that. I mean, I don't look at it and come find out. Both my parents did the spit test, and I'm a hundred percent British Isles and Northern Europe. I have mm-hmm. no Latina in me at all, as much as I would love to. I'm zero Latina, so um, it was just I think it's just more of a confidence thing. Like I knew that I was going to make make mistakes, and I wasn't afraid of making mistakes. I wasn't afraid of sounding like an idiot. I said some derogatory things without knowing, you know, but people were patient with me. The Mexican culture, thankfully, is incredibly, I mean, just culturally, they're very patient people. And so that really, that was a big advantage too, is it wasn't like I'm um, dealing with a, you weren't trying to, you know, I might've, what now? You weren't trying to learn French in Paris. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Precisely. And I would never go to Paris without having a a, a good foundation of French out of respect. (laughs) (laughs) But precisely. So that made it a lot easier too. So I mean, there are just a lot of things were in place that, I mean, I I was fearless and I studied regularly every day, like at least a half hour a day. Um, So on on the Spanish, using an an audio uh, program, it was called Camino del Éxito. And it still exists, but it wasn't like Rosetta Stone. I think it's way better than Rosetta Stone. I wish there was a Camino del Éxito for French so I could, you know, learn French. 
French is the only language I actually studied formally. I had four years really? of it in high school. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, um, okay. So we were like at your exit strategy, you saved up money, you found a job, yes. um, that was full time, but still left you with a lot of time and energy. And most yes. importantly was all about music. It's so, all a music job. Exactly. I think what's pretty cool with that as well is, um, I heard, I think it's like Tim Ferriss saying, recommending that you learn a job on someone else's dime. So yes. like you were still studying the piano. So that, yes. that job was actually forcing you because you had deadlines every week yep. you know, to continue with the piano and to improve and you were already getting paid. So that's, yes. that's really, really good. Yes, and, exactly. And, and again, it was just, I mean, there's the worst thing is that wasn't music, if you will, is maybe what it's picking the songs for a Sunday or that's, but that's still music. I mean, what do I do? That's not music. It's pretty much all music arrangements. Um, I, I was able to do a lot of compositions and I, my gosh, I've been, At this point, I've got so many, I've got hundreds of compositions for the church, you know, that, that I'll be, you know, getting online now. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's just, it was a good experience having to um, teach a choir and, and learn doing that. So there's, um, you know, running rehearsals and with musicians and, and, and choir members, teaching people how to sing, you know, yeah. building up a program. That was, a, there's a lot of, of that, you know, and there's, that, that takes energy, but it just, it didn't it didn't drain my creative energy, you know? Okay. It, yeah. And, and how are you, so to build up like your, your music career uh, on the side of, of that job, what did you do? You do a lot of uh, performance, live performance? Or? Yeah. I started playing out, started, actually I started advertising and this was before, mm -hmm. I mean, it's not that many years ago, but like right now there's a lot of um, gig platforms like, you know, the gig salad, gig masters, wedding wire, all these different platforms. When I started advertising, I did it again, using my engineering side and, and knowing programming, I just used the right keywords. And this was before SEO was even as big. And so when you search for pianist Phoenix, I was like the first one that came up and I had a bunch of different landing pages that had, oh, had landing pages. pages. Okay. Yeah. That I just developed on my own. And, uh, this is like before people were thinking to do this. So, Um, I was able to make really good money just doing private events, you know, and I, and I would, I came up with a contract and, um, cause I would get booked for other events too. Like people would hear me and then they'd be like, want to book me. And then one guy ended up, you know, he wanted to send me a contract cause it was like with city of Scottsdale. And so I grabbed that contract, probably wasn't legal, but I did and re rewrote it for myself. And then I, and that's, I still use that contract today, awesome. but I, I mean, Today, I don't book as much. I'm going in a different direction. But at the time, that's what I, that's what I did. I advertised online um, and, uh, and just, like I said, had different landing pages. And if you're looking for wedding musician or wedding ceremony music or um, a pianist in, in, the, in the Phoenix area, I was, I mean, my website always came up. Okay, so when you say advertise online, it's like you had the, all those landing pages and you were popping up organically on Google. Through organically, the not paid. Okay. Always I did start paying eventually for um, okay. Gig Salad, um, and and just because I got in there so early, it was like I was able to build up reviews and stuff over time, you know, and and um, you know, make sure you. I was never really good at asking for reviews. It was more like, okay, the gig's done, move on. So I mean, I've got like maybe 30 reviews or whatever. I should probably have a hundred, but yeah. that's just that was never a big priority. You know, it's more, it's still cover gig. So I was never super passionate about it. It was more of those, I'm doing this and I'm, uh, I'm doing this kind of, of, of work because I want to get better as a musician. I want to be oh. a better performer okay. and, and be a better singer and a better pianist. And this was all more of a making me as, you know, just again, a better and, and understanding how to be a better entertainer all around. And again, um, you're getting paid along the way. People absolutely. are paying you to improve. Okay. Yeah. And my voice was the big thing. Another thing too, is like at least golly, maybe even now more like half of my works in Spanish. Yeah. So that's a huge thing. It might be only 40% or maybe there's, maybe it's, there's more bilingual, but a lot of my work is in Spanish and that was a big advantage that I had. Okay. Yeah. In the so. area. Okay, cool. And did you use any like free services like Craigslist or did you have no. like, no, Just I maybe did put something, but those, that never turned out to be anyone that advertised for wanting a musician on Craigslist was usually not going to pay what I, what was worth it to me. Okay. Uh, and you decided maybe, early, how did you decide what was worth it 
Do you like, did you have any trouble with the pricing? How did you, how much did you charge at first? Did you? I guess at first I thought, uh, maybe $75 an hour kind of thing. And then mm -hmm. over time, I just began to, over time I began to raise my rates because I wanted to work less and I'd rather do higher quality work. And that's been, I don't do, I don't play out nearly as much now, but I make a lot more when I do. <laughs> so, and, uh, and when you decided on 75, when you were first starting out, how did you come up with that figure? Did you just look at what others were charging and, and, or did you just decide, okay, I don't want to like move my stuff around the city for it, less than. Yeah. It was more like, okay, $75, two hour minimum. And that's like, I'm thinking, my gosh, I would play a, an event for $150. I would, I would not do that today. You know, okay. and so it's, <clears throat> uh, it, yeah, and moving the, yourself around the city was, and, and the hassle of bringing all the equipment and like, cause I'd have to bring a, you know, a, a digital piano and a PA and all that. And so it was, I guess it was, yeah, it was, it was more of that kind of situation for a private event. At least when I first started doing public events, I, um, I think I accepted like three hours for a hundred dollars plus dinner, drinks and tips kind okay. of thing. That's when I started. Yeah. I wouldn't do that now. It's too yeah. little, you know, but that's, and cash has to be cash because if you get paid in cash, that's like a 30% raise, depending on what you, you know, how you claim, you know, you do your taxes and stuff. But. And um, did you ever do free gigs? Um, did I ever do? I'm trying to think. It sounds like if you did, you didn't do many. <laughs> I did one. I remember doing one free gig and but I could barely play piano and I just sang and just kind of like hacked along and it was just a public thing in downtown Tempe for this um and I just said hey I'll provide music because it was more like I'll try to look for opportunities to get out there and people did take my card I don't know that I ended up getting any work from it but I realized I was like that was a lot of work and it was a good experience but I'll never do that again okay so I, I don't know that I ever do any other free gigs I don't I don't want to devalue what I'm doing I, I've done, I have done free gigs. Yes. My friend's dad died and I played for the funeral last Thursday and they're like, what do we owe you? I'm like, what are you talking about? You don't owe me anything. Yeah. So yeah, the situations like that, but just free gigs. No, not really. Yeah. You're not into the play for us and you'll get some exposure kind of thing. That's the biggest crock of crap. I can't <laughs> believe people. Oh, no, no, no okay, I cool. can't. No. <laughs> All right. So, uh, can you walk us a little bit through like how that evolved? Like you, so you left your six figure job, got a low pay, lower paying job, uh, started doing more cover gigs and how yes. did you know, charging, start charging more and more. Um, yeah, I really how, just built that whole thing up. Uh, because I can't to, like, how, how long did it take to, to be at a level that, you know, like, where you were financially uh, happy with what, well, I guess you were f financially happy as soon as you got the 36 and you were doing only music, <laughs> you know? I like, was, yeah, I was happy. I yeah. was happy. Then I was still making more money on top of that. Cause that was just yeah. the little, the little, the little salary. But plus I had health insurance. So I was really nice and I'm only doing music. Yeah. That took it as it, I ended up, I worked maybe at first some 60 hour weeks in that job too. Cause there was so much new. So the first year was, it was a lot of music. I really like doing Christian music. I like doing music for the Catholic church. So it was a good fit. Um, but there was so much new stuff that it was more like, I didn't, I mean, I had my advertising going and I would do little gigs on the side and okay. I really wanted to do more private events because I could control better my song list. So okay. I knew, okay, these people, I can specifically say, these are the songs I'm going to play. And then it would be easy to be prepared. Whereas when you do public events, if you do public, um, gigs then it's like oh well we don't want that music do you have this kind of music do you have that kind of music and like today i've got hundreds of songs but when i first started out it was it's it's discouraging because you're you're singing your heart out and you're doing maybe your original tune or maybe you're doing a cover and they're like uh well do you have any led zeppelin i'm like i'm a chick singing piano you know on piano and singing what what do you do you think i have any led zeppelin guess what i have a led zeppelin now <laughs> but you know several years ago no and and, and it's it as confident as I was in some things I was really not confident in my piano playing because it's like mm -hmm. I compare myself to you know Bill Evans and you know amazing Chuchito Valdez and just amazing players and I'm still like 
I hold my own, you know, now, but it's, I was, that was always a source of, of, um, fear and insecurity is not in vocally, but in my piano playing. So it's, yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, well, I, I think that happens a lot when, when we start an instrument later, uh, later yes. in life, it, it had, like, we have that adult brain telling us stuff we shouldn't listen to, uh, but. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. that voice is usually really, really quiet, like, in my, my head, yeah, but, it, but at that time, it was. Kryptonite. Yeah, precisely. But during that, it was, it was hard. And so I wasn't as aggressive at doing public gigs as I would have been. What helped me in the whole public gig thing was people just hearing me at like private events and say, oh, you should play at this restaurant or whatever. And so I got referrals from people that heard me in the area and finally ended up, I landed one steady gig where the owner of the restaurant just absolutely loved, loved my voice and loved my playing. And, um, he loves Alicia Keys and I do a lot of those yeah. covers. So, and that kind of stuff. So, um, I ended up playing there twice a month and it was, it was decent pay, you know, plus dinner and drinks. And, um, I still, that he doesn't own the restaurant. Some actual Italians from Italy bought the restaurant out, but I still play there. You know, I make more money than I did then. You know, we, we negotiate, but like I've had that gig now, what, seven, seven years, eight years. I think it's been eight years. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. but I, that was, I started that, but then because of my advertising, people found me when they were like, oh, we have a piano bar and we want someone to come play. And so I even did the dueling pianos thing for like six months, but it was like, oh my gosh, this is not for me. And I, I accepted it wasn't for me. I didn't want to, I wanted to actually perform songs and just not try to get people drunk and tipping <laughs> and bi bi these bidding wars or tipping wars or whatever. I just, it didn't feel, it wasn't me. So what, what, but I what learned a lot. Sorry, I'm not familiar with the, what is that? Dueling pianos? It's called dueling pianos. Yeah. Where people can put up requests and like they'll, you know, give a tip for a request. And if someone requests a song that someone else doesn't want to hear or they hate, then they have to tip a higher tip to stop the song. And then they go into tipping words. I remember one time, like I, I got off my shift and I'm in the back with the other pianos. I'm like, Oh my gosh, I did it. We did it. And I, I made like $300 in this tip. Bidding. It, did, it felt dirty. <laughs> Taking advantage of drunk people, this you know, man. and, you know, and what did you win? Oh, you won. So I played all of your song or you stopped me, you know, and I just, I think I quit a month later. I just couldn't do it anymore. Uh -huh. Um, but, but that's something that people make amazing money at if you like it, yep. you know, and, and you can make, cause you get, you'll get your stipend like 150 or whatever for the night. Plus the tips and tips are legit in dueling pianos, yep. but it just wasn't for me. So yep. <clears throat> you've got to be true to yourself. You know, I didn't leave. If I wanted to make good money, just doing something. I would have stayed in engineering. I yeah. wanted to leave engineering to do something I really wanted to do. So, and some people wouldn't want to do church music. I mean, that, that's something that I do. I love doing. So it worked out really well, but some people might want to make, want to teach. I'm not a teacher. You know, I, I have zero desire to, to, to teach, you know? So there's so many different things people could do, but that was, that was my path. And cool. I just kind of built it up over time until finally I'm like, wait a minute, I need to get my own music out. And so I, you know, I, I'm, I'm doing covers. I'm doing okay on covers. It's time for me to, to, to record and release my own music. So I started recording nice. <laughs> and then I released my, I finally released my own album. It'll be eight years ago this, um, this June. And I'm going to release my, what, my fifth or sixth, seventh album. Golly, I've put out a lot of music. So when, when did you release your first album? 2011 june 2011 and you had been you left your job when Oosh. i'm gonna show my age now <laughs> uh, 2000 june 2007 okay so you've got something with june <laughs> no it's just okay so it was like that's four funny <laughs> Four years between <laughs> leaving your job and the first album and but during the those four years you had a you know you were making a full time living from music straight oh, away, yeah. straight away yes. with the um the Christian music and the gigs doing cover songs. And, and doing a lot of private events. A lot, a lot of, of private, private events. Yes. Like wedding ceremonies, a lot of wedding ceremonies, playing for funerals, that yeah. kind of thing. That okay. played really well. So yeah, and when you've got Adele in your repertoire, you're 
you know, you're good to go basically for those. Kind Actually, of that's true. Yeah. Oh, but now today it's still Christina Perry, a thousand years. How many times have I've played that song a thousand times. <laughs> <laughs> and so what about Top Cat Studios? Tell me about that project. So that started, this is, a, I'm at Top Cat right now. If you yeah, can I can barely see, see the, uh, the, the, the logo back there. Um, yeah. So that this, my studio started when I, I uh, was recording the album. It all started in my, um, my, I just have, I still live in just a little townhouse because again, living, keeping living expenses down helps to live better. <laughs> and so one of the little, it's just a two bedroom townhouse. And so one of my bedrooms has a big walk-in closet. I converted that into a, um, a booth, uh, a, a, you know, um, yep. ISO booth, just okay. did a whole bunch of um, treatment. And, uh, and I recorded like my first album, I'm coming home. Um, I'm proud of it. It's, I mean, right now I, it's hard to listen to, but I'm proud of the fact that I did it. I did it all by myself. Um, and so, and I recorded, you know, drums and we just did everything right there. But, um, over time I realized I needed to get my own, own space. Cause, okay. So recording that album, after I released it, I started looking for a space to rent and I knew I was making enough money in private events. Um, uh, this CD, this was, you know, this was again, eight years ago, CDs were still selling. So I did uh, pretty well on, on sales, you know, and the CD was consistent. People would buy it, you know, whenever I played, I would sell several of the CDs. Okay. I remember even sometimes being out of CDs. I'm like, what am I doing? I'm losing money here, not bringing my CDs, not making sure I have my CDs with me. So um, I didn't get into merch. I should have, but whatever. That's in the past now. I just had CDs. And, uh, and I realized I was like, okay, I'm making good money. I know I can afford a space, right? And so, yeah, this will be was it just a, it'll be just this summary. Right after I released this, I started looking for this space okay. and started out. Um, well, I was able to find something and it was actually just so much more perfect than I could ever have imagined. And I'm so thankful how everything worked out. You know, it's been, so it's been, God, it's been, yes, it's been seven. We've been here over seven years, just over seven years. So yeah. Cause it'll be eight years. will be this June. Yeah. So we got in here in 2011 the end of 2011, like November of 2011. Yeah. So, so yeah, it's been, um, it was great. I found this space. I mean, it didn't just appear like this, obviously, you know, we had to, my husband is a, um, he's, well, he's a sculptor and an artist. So he's also a metal worker and woodworker. So he was able to help me build out the studio and like he built my diffuser panel right there. He built the sign, you know, we agreed on the colors. I designed the logo, um, I did you know, all my designs and stuff and he, but he built everything for me and helped me with the build out the ISO booth. And, um, and then of course you've got the big, this is our, you know, control room window. Oh, yeah. here. You can almost, you can even see part of the band room way back in yeah. the back. Um, so it's, so that was it. And I thought, okay, this is a place for me to work on my music and to record. And, um, because of that album, I also ended up running into or a meeting at on a private event. I met, I, we were, we were just getting into this, into this space. And so I had a studio. Uh, I just had gotten into the studio and then I happened to meet this guy who, um, wanted, who heard me sing, got my album, liked my album, saw that knew that I recorded it myself and was like, I want, um, to hire you to write lyrics or write music for my lyrics. Okay. Um, so that was, and that was really a huge, it's funny cause I have, there's, I've got so many mixed feelings about that whole time in my life because I ended up working. It's all my music, but I wrote music for his lyrics. I made a ton of money, a lot of money. Um, I, I just, we started recording here at Top Cat and eventually he was like, you know, your skills at recording aren't there. So he okay. shipped me out to Nashville, which is great. Cause I was able to learn from like, I, I mean, I recorded at, um, RCAA, which was Ben Fold studio at the time in Nashville. And also at, um, uh, what's the other one that's really big. That's got the church. Uh, I just, I can't believe I forgot the name of it. And I've, I've been there a few times, but anyway two huge studios in nashville okay and then we paid for you know, all these musicians and um i ended up doing four albums with this guy okay. and i made a lot of money i was able to buy land <laughs> up in 
and I was able to buy four and a half acres up outside of Seattle. Uh, what was your deal like? Like, cause you say he shipped you out to Nashville. Like why, uh, initially he wanted, he wanted you to write the music. He didn't hire you as a recording. Well, he, he thought, yeah, he, yeah. my bad. He wanted me to, yes, he wanted me to write, compose music. And, and when he agreed on the way that I composed it, he would give me a, the lyrics and say, I want this to sound like this Adele song or whatever, okay. or this Coldplay song or this, uh, you name it, you know, uh, Bob Seger song or whatever. And, and I would, it? what now? And he was going to sing it or you were? No, still? no, he wanted me to sing it. Okay. So he just had the lyrics and he wanted you to uh, write the music and sing it and make it sound like, you know, he had a night, a creative idea about what the music should sound like. Exactly. And so we had a partnership there and we worked on, um, I mean, over, like I said, it, it, he just, he wasn't happy with where, with where my recording skills were at the time. And they, I didn't know anything really. I mean, it is barely, I released an album and it was okay, but there's a, so much. I mean, I've learned so much more since then. Just yeah. because I'm a DSP engineer doesn't mean I know, you know, how to use all this software, right? I, I like to tell people like, um, you can be a, you know, a, a, a mechanical engineer that works on cars, but you know, and knows everything about cars, but be a terrible driver. Sure. Right. So that was kind of how I was. I understood how the software works because I've written a lot of the software, but I wasn't very good at using it to actually um, re record stuff. So because of that, he wanted the, everything to get produced in Nashville. We found, um, but so this guy had this guy had a lot of money and was basically paying for the recordings and stuff. Or this guy's got hundreds of millions. Yes. Yeah, it's just he's kind of a um, what's the word in English? Uh, I don't know. Anyway, he wanted to do something creative and he was pouring money into it. And okay. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And this is this is his. Uh, he called it the his vanity project. Okay. You know? Great. So, and you you've even listened to some of the songs. I mean, it's yeah. You know, it's good music. I, uh, so you know, we produced, a, I think you did a lot of a good music together, but it was just, um, it just, he takes up a lot of space and there was no room. Like if I'm working on a project with him, I can't be working on my own music at the same time. Then it would be like, Oh, well then you just finish that and you let me know. Well, and so. But so, was, sorry. So w when you said you made a lot of money from those projects, is it because afterwards you commercially exploited the CDs or did, did you sell? No, he paid me. Yeah, he was just hiring you to, but that's awesome. Okay, so it was. I mean, it was good pay. We're like, okay, well, we're gonna do this. Well, okay. I mean, let me just throw. An, okay, well, we'll do this, but I want ten thousand dollars. Okay, you know, I mean, we could still make better money in music licensing, right? If you get the right license, but still, hey, if you get the right license, it's not. <laughs> yeah, if you get the right license, right? So I mean, I'd make you know, I'd make just ten thousand dollars in a few months, you know, yeah, awesome. um, and work on stuff, and then you know that that's kind of how things went and we and i and i worked that way for a few years and, with and this guy found you at a private event a private yeah. event at a place yeah. called um north in north scottsdale is this place called desert mountain which yeah. i mean the cheapest house there is like uh, you know a million and a half dollars and it's oh, just okay. yeah exactly so okay, it's one so of those then the lesson for the people watching would be if you want to try to get that kind of gig where some one has a vanity project and pays you thousands to just write songs Investor. then try to perform in really rich neighborhoods <laughs> well i mean you know what here's the thing too here's what i would also say if you don't know whether you want to um, learn guitar or piano if you if you're neutral learn yeah. piano because nobody's going to hire you in their big rich house to play a guitar they're going to hire you to play that piece of furniture piano that they have that's, that's if, I mean, again, if you're filled, I never felt called to the guitar at the time. I felt only called to the piano. So, I mean, that, but if you want to, if you can't decide and you just want, you don't care, then pick piano because I think piano players make more money in general. You know? Interesting. Same I, I never thought of it that way. Um, so I, I'm a, I'm a pianist, but I've tried to learn the, the guitar and I play several instruments, but the guitar for me is the hardest and the piano oh. is the one that comes most naturally. And I thought that one of the um, flaws of the piano is, you know, you have to carry it around and it's really heavy. <laughs> so, yes. So, I mean, you can't yes. carry it. Uh, but yeah, I like your point. It's, uh, I had never thought of exploring that avenue, exploring that avenue, but I'm, you're onto something there. So I might, I'm learning jazz piano at the moment. So maybe that's something. Yes. I can do in, uh, 
smart yeah. because that's what I studied too. You learn jazz and you can play anything else. Yeah. That's, yeah. you know, I mean, yeah. okay, not classical, obviously, but I mean, any of the other popular yeah. styles. I, I, I mean, the foundation of jazz was, was another thing that was really, that I, I didn't go learn blues piano or pop piano. I specifically studied when I was trying to learn piano, I found jazz pianist to, to yeah. study with. And I don't know about you, but one of my reasons, you know, aside from the fact that I adore jazz and Bill Evans. <laughs> oh, nice. Before, um, but I also thought, and it ties back to what we were talking about earlier about, you know, you learn something and then you use it for something else is when you learn jazz piano, uh, because it's also a language that's more yes. complex than, um, you know, than pop music or, or blues. It's also, oh, yeah, definitely. I'm hoping at least will improve my songwriting and I'm sure it will. Um, it will influence your songwriting. That's for sure. Yeah. You know, and the way your, your chords, your harmonization, your chord selection, that's, sure. I think that's pretty, I have to dumb stuff down sometimes, a lot of times when you don't want it to be too sophisticated because it's not, that's not the target of the song, you know? So, all right. So, um, studio started at the end of 2011 and yes. you recorded four or five albums <laughs> with this guy. So yes. what's been your journey like between 2011 and, and 2018? It was just more of the same, uh, um, working with the church, doing private events and recording those albums with the, for the Vanity Project? Or yeah, well, and then I, my last one was released. My last thing with uh, Tom, is the, the guy's name, uh, was released three years ago. Okay. And then I decided after that, I was like, mm, I don't think I'm doing this anymore. I need to work on my own music. But a, a big project came in because we decided that we wanted to buy, um, this is a totally aside, but I mean, obviously, I'd, you know, we had been building up the studio. I'd been record, picking up recording studio clients on the side as well, but not actually working on my own um, original recordings. Mm -hmm. So about two years ago, I started a band, Bohemian Insurgents, because I really, um, I wanted this organic uh, Latin folk kind of sound, which is something I've been developing over the past couple years now. So it's been, a, I, I have like, I've got like just the steady work. I've got a good reputation in town. I don't have a lot of online sales. That's not, that's where I'm trying to go now, but mm -hmm. I've not, or, or, you know, licensing and all that after, especially after, you know, having a consultation with you, I do have a catalog of music right now. I'm getting that catalog of music, um, you know, metadata out and all that, but I've been just developing a lot of doing a lot of songwriting and, and, um, um, building up my, I guess my, still building up my catalog, but not actually releasing a lot of things yet. So um, I've, I've had, a, I still have plenty of work. I mean, I just, I, I get, I have a reputation in town by now and people call me and I get, I don't have to, I don't. For private I just, events. Yeah, private events or even public events, like a restaurant. It's like, hey. Yeah, but I mean for like, performing, for performing life. Okay. It's all performing stuff. So, that's, that's one of my biggest things right now still. Okay. And the recording studio did, did you get, did you build that up? Like, did you do anything to get more customers in or is it just referrals, people from, um, that meet you at like, your live gigs and ask about recording how you, uh, cause you've got a really nice website going, uh, last time yes. I checked anyway. <laughs> and, yeah, it is. It, yeah. It's still the same. I, I've got a new site that I'm developing in the back. Yeah, end, no, but, yeah. Um, so yeah, so I ended up, getting mostly by word of mouth. I, I did put on a Google page. I created a Google page for Top Cat Studios, but there are a lot of studios in town that are way more laser focused on actually helping other musicians um, re achieve their, you know, musical dreams or whatever. And I, okay, I'll, so get hired, right. I'll, I'll get hired um, through like people finding me on Google. I mean, I really haven't done any, um, uh, only organic advertising right now because of the word of mouth, because guess what? I'm the only Spanish speaking studio in town. Okay. So I've done a lot of Spanish recording because a lot of the other studios, maybe like by now they probably have translators and stuff, but I'm the only Spanish speaking audio engineer that has my own studio, real studio, not um, just a, like a, you know, a room in my house. Not that that's not real too, but I mean, people, if people are looking for a Spanish speaking studio, yeah. then that's, I've done a lot of recording in Spanish. 
So. And so what, what would you say your revenue split is between the live performance and the, and the recording studio? What it was, uh, because right now, as I told you, I am changing my business model right yeah. now and I've raised my rates so that I do less recording other people right now. Okay. Um, but at the time it was probably live performance, 70% or so, and then 30 studio, which was about what I wanted at the time. So. Okay. And you were saying, so you, you decided to change business model? Yeah. Well, because I've been, you know, just trying to understand this whole music licensing thing, but I was not convinced that um, after, you know, going, even taking Catherine Heller's course, she, to her credit, she did give me a refund because I wasn't happy with it. Um, but but I, I just was learning about music licensing. I um, reached out to some music supervisors even and have, you know, some few conversations with a couple of those, but trying to figure out how to, how could I position myself? How can I, you know, use my existing catalog? Um, what, what do I need to change the way that I write songs? Do I need, but I wanted to stay authentic to me and not like, oh, I, cause I saw people, you know, putting out all this music that just sounds like they're just trying to copy this, you know, hit song as opposed to actually writing something that um, is really authentic and from the heart. And I'm not, I, I guess, I guess that's what I'm trying to do is write. And I have been writing, you know, um, songs that really express my understanding of the human experience that are very, that are still authentically me, but producing them and learning how to produce them in a way that is um, more commercially viable. Okay. And we go back to that, um, what we were saying earlier, that if you were in it for the money, you made, you know, you made a very good income before starting music and you mm -hmm. could still make a lot more money um, because programming and coding, you know, you've got the yes. skills, you started young. <laughs> yes. Uh, I'm struggling on data camp to learn Python, but you know. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Oh my gosh, I've written so much in Python. Python's a great language. Yeah. So you and I have way too much in common. This is insane. <laughs> yes, Python's great. I have a whole, my whole texting system's written in Python, but that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, um, yeah, I think it's important what you're saying that it sounds like from, you know, the story, your, your story, what you're telling us about you is that you have had a lot of different opportunities and mm -hmm. you've pursued many and every time you just, you know, cause it's important to pursue many. So, you know, you know, what works and what doesn't, but you're also yes. relentless in coming back to the center and something that suits you. And that's yes, it's, I feel like I've been, my whole journey has been just like yeah. this. Now, I've not had any problem making money. I've made six figures in music for the last seven years. Even I haven't even worked with the hedge fund manager, but I still do it because I just, you know, it, again, it's a lot of performance and I still, um, I still have, you know, studio clients and such, but um, I'm you just find a way to, <laughs> to make it work, you know, and, and I live, we were able to buy, I mean, we live comfortably. We were able to, we bought, you know, property up in Washington. That was another thing that I took on that's, that did take a lot of time is buying a property and building a tiny house. So that's, that's taken many months of time out of my, away from being able to, to work on music, but it's been worth and, it. So if you were like, if you were, Earlier during our conversation, you mentioned that you were, uh, that at the beginning you were, so for Spanish, for example, you were studying at least half an hour a day. Uh, for yes. piano, you were coming back home from work and you were studying the Playing piano. For hours. <laughs> yeah, for hours, trying to build that set so that you could perform live. So yes. if, you were like, if you were to give like one, would that be the one advice you would give to people to just like focus on, 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 on the practice or, you know, is there anything you would do differently that, I mean, I guess that's two questions. Like what's the one thing you, you think would be most helpful to someone starting out um, in music, trying to make a full-time living from music and who's like, like you, you know, can, has a, a good voice and can, or, you know, is good at an instrument or has a good voice. Mm -hmm. So maybe well, well, performing. Or, well, 
well, what I think is the most important thing that they, that they work on. Yeah. Um, like, well, what, what, do you th- would- what, what do you think is the one thing that s- helped you make money from music? Being resourceful, being resourceful in general. I mean, oh, that's a, that's a generic response, but it's true. Where are your strengths? And I mean, okay, piano wasn't my strength, but I found that that, let me give you a little reason why I decided to play piano. I went to a jam session, right? A jazz jam session. And I wanted to go up and sing a, a you know, Bossa Nova ballad, heaven forbid, Gingy actually. Um, the pianist, they did not want me to come up. They wanted only horn players. I didn't want to play drum. I just wanted to sing. And it was not a good experience. I felt like they rushed it. I actually know all these guys. They're all my friends and colleagues now, but they, at the time, they don't even know who it was. Um, they, they rushed the song. It was, um, it went to, it was just, I, I sang it well. It just wasn't a good experience. I left feeling like, ugh, and I got so angry. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to learn how to play that piano myself and I won't need any of you assholes. And that was a big motivator is I was like, I had to learn how to play the piano. And I bring up that story because a lot of, I think you should focus on your strengths and not just trying to be halfway decent at a bunch of things, but really focus on your strengths. And that was something though, that I realized I had to make a strength to do what I wanted to do. Cause I didn't want to be a singer that constantly had to depend on other musicians to be able to, you know, perform. Okay. So if you, if, if you're an independent person and you're a good singer, I mean, I, if you want to, if you want to do, if you want to be a performer, I would say learn an instrument, learn an instrument that you can use to accompany your, your voice. That would be number one. And it's, interesting that's one that you, it's interesting that you say that because uh, that's the reason I learned how to produce my, my own music because yep. I figured, okay, otherwise I depend on other people to do it. It's, uh, it's yes. tense and, and, you know, I depend on someone else. So I have that same thing, not, you know, not with a piano, but um, of just being able to rely on myself and not depend on anyone else. I think that I've taken that too far in the sense that I have, I didn't collaborate enough with other people. And that's something I want to change that I yes. want to collaborate more. <laughs> uh but it's still you know it's served me well um and yeah so i i think that's a great uh a great point and if you were gonna if you were to start over again today is there anything you would do differently or you would focus is there something you would focus more on or something you just wouldn't bother with i would never have worked with that guy oh yeah (laughs) Because I think I could have built, made better music. I think I could have learned and focused rather than have to do the things the way. I mean, I learned a lot. I've learned a lot. And I don't regret the lessons. and I don't regret the money. But I think I could have built up a better business for myself if I had stayed true. Because I didn't really want to do his stuff. I wanted to do my own. And, uh, and I'll, I'll tell you, it's true. I did not need him. I got this studio before he came along. I was in this building. Yeah. You know, I, I was already paying my bills. I was already, I just released my first album. And where do you, so that reminds me of something that, that I've been through. Um, I went through as well. And I'm, mm-hmm. I'd like to know like how you feel about it. So sure. Some, something similar happened to me. And then, and it, it's similar in the sense that I think I could have made something better on my own if I had backed yes. myself more, if I had yes. backed myself more. And I ended up, you know, going for, like, I knew the money would be good and I knew it would be, you know, yeah, the money would be good and it would be easier because I wouldn't have to address, you know, stuff that I didn't want to, you know, I didn't feel confident about. So instead of backing myself and learning, uh, yes, I just went and relied on 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 someone else, and <coughs> so for me, <coughs> you're right. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. sinus um, infection. <laughs> yeah. So for me, at this point, again, I don't regret the money, and I don't even regret the you know the the collaboration because uh, I did learn a lot. But yes, I it's more like I'm angry with myself for not backing myself more. Like I could. You know, I, I could have done it better. And if I were to do it differently, I think the lesson I've learned from that is that when I don't have the confidence to do it, I one 
one way that that I can give myself the confidence is to find someone that's doing it the way that I want to do it and model model their way. And, yeah. You know, and their patience and the one thing they're focusing on. And, you know, that, that's why I've been, I've been, um, one of the guys that, one of my mentors is called, uh, Neville Medora. Mm-hmm. He's, that, he's a guy who writes about copywriting. <laughs> uh, nice. Like, and, um, and anyway, <laughs> just, every time he speaks in an interview, he's, he mentions how, well, you know, he always focuses on writing the best possible post about that subject. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so he has a blog that's, uh, he's my model for, for like creative and productive for building mm-hmm. that, that, that website and, and that, uh, that name yes. I'm on, on him. I'm modeling him anyway. So, um, that's a little bit of uh, my story. So you don't, you don't feel bad about like, uh, you know, working on projects that, uh, sometimes, sometimes the, the kind of easy money is tempting, uh, in yes. the long run, it's, <laughs> it's rarely a good idea in my experience. <laughs> That's exactly what I would say. I would not have done that. I, I would have instead, because I felt like, I mean, the lyrics are so, um, it, sure, I was writing the music, but I was like, I'm a good lyricist. Okay, sure, maybe, you know, people disagree. I feel I am singing songs that I don't, I'm don't they don't mean anything to me. Yeah. You know, the music is my music, but the lyrics don't mean anything to me because I didn't write them. And quite frankly, uh, um, philosophically, this guy and I don't agree on on, on much. Um, so it was, it was, there was a lot of that, but it was such good money. And so if I, yeah, if I could do it again, I would say, no, you don't need this, this job. You don't need this gig and you can, you, you need to focus or maybe just do one CD with him and not have continued to do so many. Um, but maybe that's what I would do again. But yeah, I, I believe that people, whatever you're doing, you need to stay true to your artistic vision and what feels good to you in your heart. That that's going to keep you going when you're depressed or you feel like, uh, ah, the song's not doing as well as I want. If you really believe in the music that you're creating, then if, if the supervisor, music supervisor won't return your email or this, um, people so and so rejected your music or your song or your you know um outreach whatever if you believe in what you're doing then that's going to help you keep going yeah and, and you did your best right yeah that's all yes. you can do that's all what right. you got to do yeah <laughs> um you've got a new project going on yes well since talking to you um, I do have a, a catalog of, you know, about, I don't know, it's not that large. I'm building it up, but um, about maybe out a hundred songs right now. And so I large. decided, what now? It's what pretty large. Know? A lot of people will be, what? Not like, well, it depends on, on the perspective, you know. But. I guess I've been doing this. I think, I, well, what, Sorry. you know, yeah. yeah. I, if I was, if I had been doing this for seven years, just my stuff, then I would have hundreds of songs. Sure. But anyway, that's, an, that's another story. So I've got my catalog. And after like your consultation, one thing I realized is like where I've, because I've been looking at this and I see like that music supervisors are so inundated with emails and people reaching out to them as a singer songwriter or whatever, it's, it's, it's hard. And I don't want to just have to split my profits with the library. So I'm developing my own boutique library and I'm making it beautiful. <laughs> and I mean, no, really, it's gonna be a beautiful website, easy to use. A music supervisor can go in there, do a quick search term and know right away if, if a song could potentially match. And when, it, and when um, they return songs, I want it to be a nice, beautiful listing with the description of the song, um, the verbal description, they don't even have to press play. They get the description of the song. They know the instruments in it, all that, all that, all that pertinent information that they could come through quickly um, and be able to download it right there. Kind of like disco, but just not so busy, you know, and, and like a lot of these libraries, they're so busy and they're just like stuffs everywhere and it's so distracting and it's not easy to use necessarily and just blah. So no, I'm going to, that's what I'm going to do. And then I'm going to send that, and then I'm going to send that library out to music supervisors and I will target advertise them on all of the advertising platforms. And you know what I'm talking about when I say that, right? So that's, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. And they can, you know, I know that I I know I'm going to, that's going to, that's going to work. 
and I'm meditating the hell out of my songs, just like <laughs> that's it. I even paying someone 15 bucks a song to go and, and do this, follow through your exact steps. So right. yeah, you know, I'd love to follow up with you in six months and see how this comes out because Absolutely. The, system, very interested. the system should be done. I, I, I mean, seriously, I wake up this morning and I'm so excited to program the system, you know, and uh, I'm developing it all uh, in WordPress, you know, and using obviously some, some minimal custom PHP because I hate PHP. It's the ugliest language around, but um, so just developing the site and, and this catalog, making it searchable. And like, I wake up at like six something this morning and I can't wait. I've got to get in front of my computer, you know, after my morning routine, walk the dog, et cetera, so that I can keep working on this. And I had even more of a breakthrough today and I'm making it quick for me to add songs, um, and, and, and do keywords and metadata and all that in this system. And yeah, it's, that's where I'm going. And I'm still, you know, between juggling that and private events, so I don't, um, it's, it's a lot of work, but I'm so excited about it, you know? I'm That's working on awesome. new songs, recording. I got someone, I got a, one of my collaborators coming over in 45 minutes, and we're going to work on, a, you know, one of my uh, next big songs that's huge production and just like you i didn't want to have to be paying a producer especially when i know i'm an engineer and i can do this stuff so i decided i want to want to i want to produce on my own but i am still collaborating with other people in songwriting also working with i'm a better engineer than this one guy that's coming over but he's got these great ideas so we're sh we're going to do a profit sharing on the song right awesome. so and i've got all the documentation for all that too yeah. to keep everything you know everything uh all the, the, the I's dotted, T's crossed and all that. So, so if we do get a $10,000 offer on this song, there's like, no, 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 you, you know, you're getting 30%. That's it. We already agreed this. <laughs> so yeah, well, that's, that's where awesome. I'm going. Yeah. Awesome. That sounds super exciting. And I think there might be an, another business opportunity for you in the future. When, once you've developed that, um, that new library where you might be able to license the model to, you know, have a WordPress theme of some sort, or maybe something like oh, that. Oh, nice. Or right. sell my system or sell my library. I would system. be interested in a system that's clean and beautiful like that. So keep me posted and uh, we'll talk soon anyway. Thank you yes. so much for, I'll, um, you know, I, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but thanks so much for talking to me and I'm sure everyone on creative and productive will love um seeing you so i love what you're doing thank, thank you. you i, uh, I love you your can, articles and you've helped me so i appreciate you <laughs> thanks a lot <laughs> and i'm really excited about your projects i'm sure i'm sure it's going to work out for you i think so too thank awesome. you bye rebecca right. talk to you bye. soon bye joyce take care